Okay, so we'll pick up this time in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, we see that David is uh, finally king of all Israel. He's moved to Jerusalem. He set up and established the worship of the Lord. He desired to build God's temple. God said, no, your son will do it, um, uh, but I will give you an everlasting kingdom. He does some battle. Uh, he goes out and begins to occupy uh, territory and conquers other people, other peoples who were living in the land God had given to Israel, and uh, and sets up his his uh, his cabinet, let's say his royal cabinet, um, with, with uh, David and Joab, Jehoshaphat, and Zadok, and, and the others that were mentioned uh, previously uh, in, in the previous lesson. And uh, so he comes back from the Valley of Salt. He pens Psalm 60 sometime during the Valley of Salt battle or immediately thereafter. And he gets back and he decides he wants to show some kindness to, uh, to the house of Saul. Um, and, and so he begins to kind of try to seek out the house of Saul and he sort of vindicates his genuineness uh, in this action that this was not a ploy. He didn't just want to pretend to be Saul's friend. He, didn't, he wasn't looking to claim to honor God's man, but get himself the position of king anyway. Uh, and he really, really dis, uh, demonstrates his genuine love and affection for Saul and his family. Uh, we see that uh, here starting in chapter 9. And I, I want to read, um, well, let's read verse 4. I don't know if I want to read the entire passage. Uh, but but beginning in verse 1, and David said, Is there yet any left, any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember, he loved Jonathan. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And you remember, just kind of weird out of the middle of nowhere, a couple of chapters back, we're introduced to Mephibosheth. Um, and that was done so that this story would make a little more sense. Remember that Mephibosheth is lame on his feet. Verse 4, And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So um, uh, he, he doesn't, he has nothing. He's lame, which in that culture was a, 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 I mean, it was an assurance of being destitute. Uh, but beyond that, he was of the uh, removed house uh, of Saul, which would be another mark against him. He doesn't even own his own place. He's living in someone else's house. So we find that this destitute, lame man living on the grace and charity of someone else uh, and by all rights, ought to be an enemy of the current um, uh, dynasty, ruling dynasty in Israel, is in Lodabar, and David is coming to see him. And you, you, you have to imagine, again, use your imagination, how he must feel uh, when he finds out David's looking for him. And the king David sent, verse 5, and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amal, from Lodabar. Now when, Mephibosheth, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reference. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? And the king called to Ziba Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Then Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servants, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son, whose name was Mekah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and was lame on both his feet. So, 
uh, the, the, just, just a wonderful, wonderful story of David's grace and humility reaching out to the previous dynasty and any that remained. So all of, sons, all of Saul's sons are now dead. Mephibosheth was assassinated um, at the turning, at the, at around the time David became king of all Israel. Um, the other three sons were killed in battle with Saul, so that whole generation is gone. And Jonathan, David's dear, dear friend, uh, has a son, and David seeks him out, and he gives him the honor of his family um, and provides for him in ways that somebody in his condition in that day and age would never have been able to do for themselves. And what a great picture uh, of, of us and our condition uh, we are estranged from God. We are unable to provide for ourselves. And in his loving kindness, God comes to us weak and, and destitute children and provides for us uh, a, a way to become a son of the king. And what a, what a beautiful, beautiful picture that is. Uh, of, of the grace of His Majesty David condescending to the uprooted, destitute, and broken Mephibosheth and makes him as one of his own sons. I, that's just, that is just so beautiful. And um, I, I, again, it just is a testament, not just to David, but to David's um, uh, faithfulness and continued love for Jonathan specifically in the house of Saul generally. I just think that's awesome. He gives, uh, he gives the last remaining servant of Saul, Ziba, um, and his 15 sons and 20 servants to be his household staff. You go out and till the land for him. You, you take care of your master, son of Saul, a son of Jonathan, son of Saul, Mephibosheth, uh, and, and he said, but he's going to eat at my table. And uh, so I, I just, uh, that's just wonderful. It provides for him. What are they tilling the land for if he's eating at David's table? Uh, I think he's providing means of income for him. So whatever Mephibosheth's servants reap in the field, he'll be able to sell. And uh, so he's provided an income for him. He's provided food for him. He's provided a house for him. He's provided staff for him. Uh, and he said he's going to be as one of my sons. And wow, it's beautiful. Uh, Mephibosheth does make some mistakes. Uh, we'll talk about those later. Um, but but as far as this particular um, account goes, it's really a parable of how God comes down to us and provides for us when we could not provide for ourselves. And wow, what a beautiful, beautiful story that is. Um, uh, so we move on then to chapter 10. Uh, and and, and uh, David wants to show uh, some more kindnesses to his friends, the people who helped him. Uh, it came to pass that after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanun, his son, reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanun the Lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he has sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Now, in their defense, David's kind of been doing that. David went and he conquered uh, Ammon and he went out and he conquered um, these other lands. And he has been out there and he's not just defending himself anymore. He's out to conquer. He's out to get the land God promised his people. And, um, and, and, and so in their defense, you know, they, they kind of have a point. Uh, but David's intent really was to be a friend uh, to the son of, of his friend. Um, so, uh, and it's kind of, I don't know, I think it's a little humorous, but whatever. Um, David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city, spied out, and overthrow it. Verse 4, Wherefore Hanun took David's servants, shaved off the one half of their beards, cut their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. So, he literally shaved off half their hair, cut their garments all the way down to stark naked, and they wore half a robe or half a tunic or whatever it is they had, uh, it says all, even to their buttocks. And so he, he cuts, he, he, he basically publicly shames um, these representatives of David. Um, 
when they told it unto David, he said to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed, you can imagine. And the king said, tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, the king, and of King Maacah, 1,000 footmen, 1,000 men, and Ishtab, 12,000 men. And when David heard it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. So we're, we're some political wrangling going on, and now we're, we're gearing up. Now, now you know what? I, I, this was in peace. This was in friendship. And you shamed my messengers before everybody. Um, tempers are flaring. Armies are amassing. Um, uh, so uh, Ammon begins to worry about what they'd done. They hire Syria, to uh, some Syrians to attack. 20,000 from Mithrab and Zobah, 1,000 from Maacah, 12,000 from Ishtab. So we're talking about an army of 33,000. That's a pretty good-sized military. Um, so David sent Joab to meet the enemy near the gate of Jerusalem. And that happens over in verse uh, 7. And when David heard it, heard of it, he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty men and the children of Ammon came out, put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rahab and Ishtab and Maacah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel, put them in array against the Syrians, and the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai his brother, that he might put them uh, put the, uh, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. So we have a battle strategy going on. Um, uh, 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 Joab put the Syrian and Ammonite armies to flight in a counteroffensive um, to the place where uh, they come against them, and they're before and behind, right at the gates of Jerusalem, the royal city, where David, the city of David. Um, and so uh, Joab commands his brother, take his army, and you go fight uh, this set of people, and I'll take my set of folk and fight against this set of people. Uh, so they, 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 uh, they put these armies to flight in this counteroffensive. Um, at, 15, at verse 15, God grants a victory. Verse 15, and when the Syrians saw they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together, and Hadad Rezer sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river, and they came to Halam, and Shobach, the captain of the host of Hadad Rezer, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Halam, and the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. So now David himself leads a battle. And, um, uh, and, and this just tempers are flaring. The, uh, they attack. Um, David sends a gift of friendship. They reject the friendship. They amass an army. They march on Jerusalem. They counter against, Jeru uh, against the armies at Jerusalem. They flee. David goes after the head honcho, and another battle uh, 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 happens. Uh, verse 18, the Syrians fled before Israel. David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians, 40,000 horsemen, and smote Shobach, the captain of their host, who died there. And when all the kings of the servants to Ahadad Rezer saw they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them, finally. Uh, so the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. Well, and, and praise the Lord for granting such amazing victory. And God is granting uh, victory after victory after victory. David now is going to destroy Ammon and he's going to besiege Rabbah. But um, a very, very uh, sad chapter in David's life is about to open up here. Chapter 11, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent to uh, Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. So here, David's been doing a lot of dirty work, but it's not like he doesn't know enough to go out and lead some battles. Kings go out to battle. David stays in Jerusalem. And it's this one decision that is going to paint, or rather put him into, the, in, into other positions of making choices he would never have had to made if he was at the head of his army as king of Israel. And it came to pass in an even tide, David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. The woman was very beautiful to look upon, and I don't have time to go into all that went on, but David has an affair with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Bathsheba discovers that she's pregnant by David, and David tries to cover her up by the whole set of palace intrigue and, and trickery and deceit. 
Um, she brings her husband. He brings her husband home from battle. Prepares a big feast for the couple. Hey, buddy! We find out later Uriah is one of the mighty men uh, who does amazing, amazing things for David. Um, and and it's it's unbelievable to me that David would treat somebody this way. By the way, Uriah was not an Israelite. Uriah was a Hittite. He had defected from the heathen peoples, the Hittites, to to join God's people, serve God's king, and God's king treats him thus. So uh, Uriah refuses to enjoy the comforts at home while his comrades are at war. And uh, David sends Uriah back to Joab, basically with a death warrant, orders, uh, orders to have to have Uriah die in battle at all costs. I think this is interesting. Go look at verse 16. It came to pass when Joab observed the, observed the city, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew the valiant men were, the hot, the heat of the battle, the hottest part of the heat of the battle. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be the king's wrath arise, he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh to the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not they would shoot from the wall? Who slew Abimelech? And he gives a couple of examples. Thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Oh, he says, when, why, when the king asks why he went so close to the, to the wall when you knew there was going to be archers there shooting people. In other words, the loss of life is so great, you've got to come up with a, with a reason for why it, it's going to be okay and assuage the anger of the king. Say this, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And while the scriptures don't flat out say it, the insinuation is, and everything will be okay. And I, I have a big problem with that. Um, the cost of, of covering his sin was okay for David. Um, it was all right that, 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 uh, that more people than necessary die in this battle that he should have been at. So um, verse 25 then said David unto the messenger, Thou shalt thus say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well another. People die in battle. Really? You're not there. You're not watching this loss of life. You're not going to have to be the one to go back and tell the widow and the, and, and the childless that their father is dead. People die in battle. Now, I, I, the only thing that I can account for in this uh, scenario is that David's heart is calloused by his sin. And sin does that. Sin callouses our heart. And when we are ruled by sin, we lose proper focus. Things that, right, uh, situations where right and wrong would ordinarily be clear become ambiguous to us. And David certainly finds himself in this position, living in a life of sin. He has at least three, he has more than three wives because he married some women in Jerusalem. And that's not enough. He has to go take someone else's wife. And, and, and so this, this is going to come back to really, really be a problem for him uh, throughout the, uh, really the rest of his life and, and beyond. Uh, so verse 27, um, uh, she, uh, your, um, uh, Bathsheba goes into mourning for her husband. Uh, when the morning was past, David sat and fetched her to his house. She became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And God was not happy with David. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the one poor. And I won't read through the whole story, but Nathan the prophet constructs a parable that reaches the hard heart of the king. And if you recall, David was a shepherd. Um, and David considered him a shepherd of God himself, a shepherd of God's people. So the story Nathan concocts is about a shepherd. Uh, two men, one rich man had many flocks, but he stole this other man's one single little lowly ewe lamb and killed it for his stranger that came to visit, for his friend that came to visit him. And, and as a shepherd, you can imagine David probably had played with some precious little ewe lambs that, that he had decided were not going to be sacrificed for, for, um, for used for sacrifice. And, um, and so Nathan successfully penetrates uh, David's heart with his story and uh, presents a formal accusation from God to David. And I want you to see David's reaction because it's just... 
once again, it's humility. Uh, let's take a look. So sad. I mean, it just makes me want to weep. Nathan said to David in verse 7 of chapter 12, verse 7, Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I, by the way, my mom used to say that to me. <laughs> She'd stick her finger at me and say, Thou art the man. And she wasn't calling me the man. She was calling me the man, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, the one that had done it. Whatever it was that had been done in the house, uh, thou art the man. And she met me and that I was the the the, the instigator of it all. Um, there was appropriate consequences that followed shortly thereafter. But the same thing happens here um, that, that, that Nathan says to David, thou art the man. Um, I anointed thee. God says, listen, mm, you're thinking way too much of yourself. Uh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. God longs to bless us, but he cannot bless disobedience. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. In God's eyes, no, David didn't pull a sword out of his scabbard and stab, scabbard and stab Uriah himself. But as far as God was concerned, he just as well might have. He says, uh, uh, And hast taken his wife to be thy wife, hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thy house. Fulfilled, I mean, all the way to, 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 to Jeroboam and Rehoboam, sons of Solomon, do not get along. Um, well, one's a son of Solomon. Do not get along. Uh, the line of Judah stays, uh, stays true to the line of David. Uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel uh, picks, I think it's Rehoboam. I get them mixed up. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, I can't remember. Anyway, picks the other one. And... Um, and, and they do not stay true to David. The sword literally never departs. The kings of Israel and Judah fight amongst each other um, uh, for uh, almost all the way until 586 B.C. Uh, when Israel gets taken into captivity. Judah is taken over, uh, I believe it's in 70 A.D., so uh, sometime later. Uh, but, but still, um, uh, just unbelievable, unbelievable bloodshed and doesn't happen in David's lifetime. I think this is what's interesting. We all think that our sin and the consequences for our sin we bear, and there are some we bear, but we never sin in a vacuum, ever. Our sin always, always affects others. David's baby dies. Uriah gets killed. The sword never departs from David's house, and God's not done yet. Look at verse, um, verse oh, uh, 11. And thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'll raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And this is about to happen. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And that's about to happen. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. And David said unto Nathan, he's talking to the king of Israel. It's pretty bold words. What's David's reaction? Oh God, you can't tell me what to do. I'm king of all Israel. Get out of here, for I have you beheaded. Nope. Not David. Verse um, 12, 13, and God said unto Nathan, or rather David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. And maybe David is sitting back, and, okay, thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. But he's not done. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Nathan departed uh, unto his house, and the Lord struck the child, Uriah's wife, bare unto David, and it was very sick. And uh, the, the child that Bathsheba carries uh, is taken home to heaven, by the way. 
David had every confidence he would see his son again, uh, verses 15 through 19. Uh, uh, he, he says, is the child dead in verse 19? And the people about him said, yes. And they said, he is dead. David arose from the earth, washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house. And when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. And they're all like, what, what in the world are, are you doing? Um, we just don't uh, understand how in the world uh, you just lost your child. You were heartbroken and, and unable to function while he was alive. Now that he's dead, you get up and you eat something and you go to the house of the Lord. And they could not, they could not figure out what had changed in David. And maybe he's finally snapped. We have no idea what's going on. Look at verse 23. Uh, let's read verse 22. I love this. This is David's entire response. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? He says something so precious. I shall go to him, and he shall not return to me. David had assurance he would see his son again. And we all lose people. And uh, sometimes you lose children. I've lost a child. Uh, three years old, three and a half years old, Wesley, went to heaven. He had complications due to epilepsy and uh, you know you hear a lot of things when you go through stuff like that you know you have a multitude of Job's counselors many times if you understand what I mean by that but going through those things uh, changes your perspective and you come to a crossroads where you say okay God am I gonna be better over this am I gonna um, am I going to allow my circumstances to back me into a corner and to question your goodness and to, and, to, um, uh, and, and to just become overcome overcome and overwhelmed by my circumstances? Or am I going to trust that your plan in my life is best for me? And it's hard. I'm not saying it isn't, e it isn't hard. It's hard, hard, hard to... Uh, process those emotions and do the thing that seems most unnatural but then again it's not really us that does it is it we have to choose that that's the direction we want to go we have to choose we're going to praise in the storm we have to choose that we're going to worship God anyway and trust that the God that God is good no matter what when we make that choice God provides the healing and God provides the um the support and the comfort to the place where for David, um, you know, my son's death was accidental. David had assurance from the mouth of God himself that it was because of his sin his son died. And I couldn't imagine what it would be to, bear, to carry that load. And yet, in spite of all that knowledge and in spite of his circumstances, he goes and he worships God. And he goes and he, uh, he eats and he resumes life. And the contrast is so drastic that people are perplexed. And we have people tell us, oh, I don't, I don't know how you made it through that. I just don't know. I don't, I don't just know. I probably couldn't have made it through that. And you know, they're probably right. Because my trials are designed for me. You weren't built to go through the things that I have walked through. And the reverse is true. There have been things that come into your life that would probably be the end of me. You see, God tailors our path, our trials, our lives, knowing that what he puts in our path is more than we can handle. But it's never, ever more than he can handle. We have to trust the potter knows exactly how much we can take. That we're being molded and shaped into what he wants us to be. Oh, it might hurt sometimes. Might have to crumple us all up and start all over again. 
but we can be sure. That the heart of God is good, even when we don't understand. David understood that. We see in verse 24, David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and I think it's significant if you read through carefully through this account, which we did not do in this class, but if you read through uh, his, uh, this account, this is the first time Bathsheba is recognized as David's wife. And I don't think that's an accident. And before it was she who had been the wife of Uriah, Uriah's wife. Um, up to this point, David has repented, and now Bathsheba is his wife. Uh, why is that? Well, I, I, I'll, tell you. I'll tell you why I think that is. David could not have a right relationship with Bathsheba until he had a right relationship with God. Once this relationship was right, this relationship could also be right. We need to look at the heart. Well, after this incident, David pens Psalm 51, and I do want to turn there and I want to look at it. Psalm 51. And what a pressure, a hymn has been written out of some of these words. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me, uh, and so on. Uh, but verse uh, of Psalm 51, to the chief musician, which would probably have been Asaph at this point, um, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So David repents, and he pens these words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. By the way, that doesn't mean he was born of, of um, uh, some people think he was born of, of rape because of that. It means he was born a sinner. He was shaped in iniquity. I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the, the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my uh, mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and a whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. He, he couldn't be right to offer sacrifices unto God until he was right in confessing and forsaking the sins that divided him from God. This was not a loss of salvation, by the way. Um, he says, uh, take not the Holy Spirit from me. That's not David losing his salvation. Uh, you have to look at, um, uh, at, 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 at the era of that time, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter who came after the Savior, went back to heaven in the ascension. Uh, 
operates, things operated differently in the Old Testament. That he, the Holy Spirit, would come on people and he would leave. He would come on people and he would leave. The Spirit of the Lord came on Samson. He was able to bow himself one last time. Um, and so on. The, the Holy Spirit would come on people. They would prophesy. Saul, right, it would come and then he would leave. And David said, I want to enjoy your presence in my life, and I don't want him to leave. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. We see there's a cry for repentance in verses 1 through 6, and then a cry of cleansing in verses 7 through 10, a cry for rest restoration of fellowship in 11 and 12, a cry for forgiveness in 13 and 14, and then a cry for restitution in 15 through 19. God, if you want a sacrifice, I'll give it. But God was not really interested in sacrifice, at least not until after the relationship was right. So if we look at verses 24 and 25, God blesses uh, David and Bathsheba. And I think this is interesting. I love this. Verse, uh, verse 24, David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son. And he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. I want to say something. It's interesting that David had multiple legitimate wives, and yet the one wife he got through ill-gotten gains is the wife that produces the next king of Israel. And how many times, even in David's own lineage, has it been the unlikely, the one that everyone else would look down on, that God uses for his purposes? Wow, that gives me such hope that God could use even me. If you look back at Rahab, uh, you look at Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. She served other gods until she attached herself to Naomi. Ends up being the great-grandmother of David who produces Solomon, not of Ahinoam or, or Abigail, certainly not Michael, but of Bathsheba, the other woman. <laughs> See, God blesses David and Bathsheba's post-repentance union with another son. That word, that name Jedediah, he's loved by God. I love that. God loved him. And when you look, he wrote Proverbs. He wrote Song of Solomon. He wrote some of the Psalms. And, and his reign was the golden era of Israel. No, David sets it up for him, hands it off to him. And he messes up. Messes up big time. Allows uh, foreign wives to bring their gods into Israel, and they steal his heart away from Jehovah. But in the end, I believe his heart was turned back to Jehovah. And Solomon gives back the love that God gives to him. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. So uh, one of the most emotional stories in, uh, in David's life, we see that, that, that uh, God provides the next king of Israel through Bathsheba. And then in verse 26, we see David goes out and conquers some more. So now Joab is still being sent places. Joab uh, fought against Rabbah, the children of Ammon, took the royal city. Rabbah was the royal city uh, of, of Ammon. Uh, Rabbah means city of waters, uh, and he conquers it. Uh, jo so Joab sent to David and let him know the city was conquered, and he desired for the credit of the victory go to his king um, and not himself. So he asks David to lead the invasion. And I, I, I kind of have to wonder if Joab was really being like, yeah, you weren't here last time, so why don't you do this one? <laughs> I don't know. You can't judge people's motives unless the Bible flat out says it. Verse 26, Joab fought against Rabba. 27, Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabba and have taken the city of waters. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and be called after my name. 
And David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took the king's crown from off his head. The weight there was a talent of gold with the precious stones, and it was set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he brought forth the people that were therein, and put them under saws, and under harrows of iron, and under axes of iron, and made them pass through the brick kiln. And thus did he all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all the people returned unto Jerusalem. Um, so David personally leads the, I mean, he's not there at the battle, so he's um, on his own personal missions. And, um, and, but, but Joab says, okay, we're ready to move in. We've defeated their army. And we're going to overtake the city. Uh, uh, but we, we'd like you to be here so that I don't get the glory for it. And uh, he probably is being humble. When I see the verbiage uh, of how it's said in the scriptures, I, I agree uh, that, that Joab desired his king to have the uh, credit for this victory. <sighs> David personally leads the occupation of Rabbah, the capital city, royal city of Ammon, uh, the city of waters. Uh, he personally removes the crown from the head of Hanun, um, which, remember, if you recall, that's the uh, the upstart that decided to send David's messengers back half naked and half shorn. Um, he had the crown of Ammon put, placed on his head. He spoiled the wealthy city. and he. But when you read that, he didn't like have them sawed asunder or smashed with iron. He, when it says he put them under, that means he enslaved them. He put them to work. And you got to imagine that. If this was the royal city, a lot of them probably weren't used to working. They probably had servants. But it was these people uh, that he put uh, under saws and under harrows of iron, and under axes of iron, and to pass through the brick kiln, not themselves. He didn't burn them alive. Uh, but they were the ones that loaded up the mud unloaded the brick after it had uh, fired. So they, they, they went through the brick kiln that way. Um, and it says that he did all the same to all the cities of Ammon. And then it says that he returns to Jerusalem. We're going to stop there uh, for now because um, now we're going to get into some of those prophecies of David's life that come to pass because of his sin with Bathsheba. And I don't want to delve into it because I want to keep things in a, in a, good, um, a good package of information without uh, starting something and having to go back and do a lot of review. But uh, we're going to see David see his house divided as God promised it would be. And, uh, and so it's going to be a sad, sad day for David for quite some time. He's king of Israel, but he's not going to be able to rule the way he is accustomed to for quite some time. And uh, so David returns to Jerusalem having subjugated Ammon, and, uh, and, uh, and so I could, we'll, just, we'll just end there. I don't want to move into chapter 13 uh, for today because it gets into a whole other topic, uh, but that's it.